All right, hello guys. It's been a long time since I've produced any content, but I've been working on a project that uh, has just come to fruition now. So I'm going to share with you the results. The results of this project uh, was uh, sort of a binary result thing. One or the other thing was going to happen. One or the other outcome was going to happen. Either outcome was going to be to my advantage, which was nice. So I'm going to tell you about the outcome that I have here. One outcome was expected, and that was the outcome I got. The other outcome I hoped for, but I didn't get that. But that's fine because, like I said, both outcomes here that I've gotten are useful for me that I can use. So we are going to start with we're going to go through a slideshow and we're going to do a lot of reading this might be a bit of a longer one but you guys are going to witness the most amazing outcome the most amazing quotes from a scientist in the peer review process that you won't even be able to believe you will not be able to believe what i have pulled out of the peer review process for you all to witness we're going to go through it together okay this just happened so let's go to this little slideshow I have here. Climate science is fraudulent, not just alarmism. The entire field is actually a fraud. And it's not just actually limited to climate science. It actually goes throughout the entire establishment of science itself. Um, and we'll get into that. So what do I have here? First thing, let's go read a paper together. So this is a paper that I wrote uh, late last year. <clears throat> and... Uh, I submitted this paper to the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, and you'll see why I submitted this paper there. Uh, so this paper was titled, An Alternative Global Mean Energy Budget Model, which is incompatible with existing ones. Okay, so that sounds like an interesting title. That's me, of course, Joseph Postma, at the University of Calgary. So here's my abstract. A global mean energy budget model is presented, which is mutually exclusive to, and hence incompatible with existing, common global mean energy budgets. A question then arises out of this incompatibility as to whether or not global energy budget models should be consistent with the laws of thermodynamics and physics and empirical reality, or if there's no requirement of such criteria, such things, within science in general. Okay, so pretty big question I'm asking. Pretty big statement. Okay, here's the introduction. A well-known global energy budget is found in Earth's annual global mean energy budget, Keel and Trenberth, 1997, whose figure 7 is reproduced in this text in figure 1 with the original ca caption from the original source. So here's the energy budget model, and you fellows have saw me, seen me, go over this model quite a bit. So they just say this is Earth's annual mean global energy budget. Okay, I won't go into the details here because you uh, people have seen me go into the details of this thing elsewhere in previous videos. So, this model is consistent with other treatments found at the textbook and classroom level regarding the climate greenhouse effect, for example, from Harvard, Harvard University in Figure 2, and also from Pennsylvania State University in Figure 3. So, here we are. You felt people have seen uh, these figures previously. So I'm just saying, saying that I'm pointing out that there's consistency between this in peer review literature and this in our pedagogy, in our classrooms and textbooks, okay? Other references to equivalent diagrams and explanations are ubiquitous. It means they're very common. This is the, the standard basis of where climate science starts. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. As I've shown in previous videos, tons of references to this. One main point of consistency between these three figures is that solar power is averaged over the surface of the Earth. That is, the cross-section of intercept of solar power by Earth's disk is averaged over the entire sphere of the Earth, giving the division by 4 as the ratio of a disk area to that of a sphere's area with the same radius, such as to average the disk intercept of sunlight over the entire sphere. This is noted as the one-fourth divisor in figures 2 and 3, so that's that one-fourth divisor right there that we're all familiar with of the solar input, which numerically is the 341 watts per meter squared as in figure one. So if you actually compute what is <clears throat> this uh, divide, divide by four value, it's this value, it's that. Oh, and it's actually 342, I wrote 341. Anyway, that's okay. Another point of consistency is the cycling of energy flux within the atmosphere labeled as back radiation in figure one and as depicted with surface directed arrows in figures two and three. So here they, call it back radiation, that arrow coming back to the surface, and here it's these arrows. So same thing. It's consistent with what they're, it's all consistent what they're doing, okay? 
This is known generally as the greenhouse effect, although real greenhouses actually function by limiting convective cooling. The general concept of a global energy budget is to conserve energy given total inputs and outputs of the system, where the input and output energies manifest from disparate phenomena, although having a net causal link between them. That is, the energy output by the Earth originates in the energy input by sunlight to the Earth, assuming that negligible geothermal contribution. However, there is largely a circuitous and complex link between solar input energy and terrestrial output energy, the circuitous link being the climate itself. We are interested in tabulating the energy flows through those circuits, for example. So I'm just describing what's the purpose of these diagrams and what are we doing? Very on a very basic level, discussion. An alternative global energy budget model is here presented in figure four, which differs in that it does not average sunshine over the whole surface of the earth as an input. This model is meant to be very simple for the current discussion, and so does not depict internal energy flows within the atmosphere. And we shall discuss only some pertinent gross differences instead. So here's this model which I've presented in previous videos. So of course, sunshine only comes in on a hemisphere with high intensity and all that discussion. We'll go over that right now because I discuss it in the paper right here. So figure four, an alternative global mean energy budget. For example, instead of averaging the incoming solar input over the entire sphere of Earth, the average solar input is instead represented as falling over only a hemisphere and with an intensity distribution which can be ideally determined as the cosine of the solar zenith angle. So that just means that most intense under the equator, falling off in intensity towards the terminator, towards the transition to nighttime to the dark side. That is, at any one time, and hence at all times, and hence also as a subsequent average, solar input falls on a hemisphere only. Certainly the surface of the earth is rotating beneath this hemispherical input, but at any time the input is only only over a hemisphere and has the expected geometrical intensity distribution. This difference has important consequences. In the standard global energy budget, with solar power being diluted over a total surface area, it never actually spreads upon the entire spherical sur surface at once. Solar power is thus reduced to 168 watts per meter squared per figure one, which is they show in, what they show in figure their figure one, which is an equivalent temperature forcing via the Stefan-Boltzmann law on a black body of 233 Kelvin, which is minus 40 Celsius and minus 40 Fahrenheit. The Fahrenheit and Celsius scales intersect there. So in other words, whole, savered, whole surface averaged solar power is extremely feeble, minus 40 degrees Celsius, freezing cold. And we wouldn't expect a climate, let alone possibly even a gaseous atmosphere, at such a low heating potential supplied by the sun. I mean, what can the sun do for our climate and for creating weather and water or anything at minus 40 degrees Celsius, minus 40 Fahrenheit input. I mean, that's very, very weak light. That's very, very weak light. That can't, you know, heat anything or produce meteorological responses at minus 40 degrees Celsius, obviously. Self-evident. I'm saying very basic things here. <laughs> okay, on the other hand, this alternative global energy budget supplies solar power over only a hemisphere with sunlight, which sunlight ever falls upon giving an average forcing of 480 watts per meter squared or temperature forcing of 303 Kelvin, which is plus 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit over the entire hemisphere, over the one hemisphere that light is actually coming in on in real time, but which maximizes around the solar zenith at 960 watts per meter squared, which is 87 Celsius or 188 Fahrenheit. And so solar power is capable of performing and producing very different physical responses between these two energy budgets, particularly in the examples of, say, being able to melt ice or the ability to generate cumulonimbus clouds, which is all about evaporation and latent heat release, so etc. Following on this point, it is relevant to reference the properties of heat flow. For example, quote, if a physical process increases the total entropy of the universe, that process cannot happen in reverse since this would violate the second law of thermodynamics. Processes that create new entropy are therefore said to be irreversible. Perhaps the most important type of thermodynamic process is the flow of heat from a hot object to a cold one. We saw that this process occurs because the total multiplicity of the combined system thereby increases. Hence the total entropy increases also and heat flow is always irreversible. 
Most of the processes we observe in life involve large entropy increases and are therefore highly irreversible. Sunlight warming the earth, for example. So this is from a textbook on thermodynamics, Thermophysics by Schrader, 2000. Other references to heat and the nature of heat flow are ubiquitous. So you can go look up discussions of the definition and properties of heat in any thermodynamics textbook and you will get this sort of uh, description in different words, but the same thing. The point being here that the standard global energy budget model depicts 324 watts per meter squared of back radiation flowing to the Earth's surface from the atmosphere, a quantity which is nearly two times larger than the solar input of 168 watts per meter squared. This implies that the atmosphere heats the surface with far greater power than the sun does. However, since the origin of energy and specifically heat is the sunlight and its initial absorption into terrestrial matter, then it is implied that the energy originally from the sun has a second and a third go around at heating the surface. So this energy coming in at only 168, this is the input. It comes back two times in order to add up to 324, but through back radiation, it's back radiation process. So basically it's reversing a couple of times, recycling a couple of times. And this multiple go around process of back radiation has the peculiarity that it is from the cooler atmosphere acting upon the warmer surface given that general relationship. Generally the atmosphere is cooler than the surface and so basically they're saying that even though the atmosphere is cooler than the surface the atmosphere is still providing two times the energy to the surface than the sun does and the origin of this energy is initially from the sun but it's recycled two times over to come back as additional heat now i hope that the listeners can tell that that sounds pretty contradictory to this definition and description of what heat is and how heat works on the other hand, the alternative global energy budget in this paper would re require only a unidirectional flow of heat down the temperature gradient, which seems more consistent with physics. That is, incoming sunshine of high intensity flux is capable of directly producing climatological effects, by that I mean meteorology, the weather, as a response to heat flow from the sun. Because as we saw in my diagram, the heat coming in from the sun is very warm. It's like 90 degrees Celsius. With that amount of heat coming in over much of the front of the earth facing the sun, well, that can generate all sorts of weather, can it? You have plus 90 degrees Celsius heat coming in. Yeah, that's going to evaporate water. It's going to create clouds. It's going to make the sunshine that you can feel when you go outside on the beach. It's going to sustain liquid water, right? Minus 40 degrees Celsius sunshine can't sustain liquid water, can it? because that's minus 40 degrees Celsius only. You need high temperature, high intensity sunshine to come in and keep water, water in its liquid state. And then this flow should step down, this heat flow from sunshine should step down intense, in intensity as heat flows down temperature gradients because that's the definition of heat. That is what heat does, it flows down temperature gradients. That's how heat originates. That's the only reason why heat flows is because is when there's temperature gradients. So heat flows down temperature gradients through the system as manifest climate. Yeah, so heat flowing from the sun and then through our earth and through the atmosphere, that's what generates our climate. That's what generates our weather and our meteorological, the meteorological responses, which we call weather and which is our climate. And then without requiring reversibil reversibility of heat flow, because obviously, given that definition and description of heat flow we had that we can get from any textbook, yeah, we should definitely not ever have reversibility of heat flow, because that's not something that's possible. It's not something in thermodynamic theory. At this point, we have sufficient preliminary analysis to tabulate a list of basic differences between the standard global energy budget and the alternative one presented in this paper. See table one. Okay, so here's a table. I make a list of the differences between the existing standard greenhouse effect model and the model that I've come up with, presented. So table one, comparison of the standard global energy budget to that of the alternative energy budget presented in this paper. So global energy budget. Item one, solar input geometry. Standard model, evenly over entire spherical surface represented as a flat plane versus alternative model over single hemisphere as a function of solar zenith angle. Global energy budget. Item two, heat flow. Standard model, heat flow is reversible and recyclable. It's totally predicated on heat reversing and recycling two times over in order to generate the temperatures and the climate we actually experience. 
In the alternative model I've presented, heat flow is unidirectional because you should always abide by the unidirectionality of heat flow from hot to cold because that is what heat does. Global energy budget, the climate in the standard model is a secondary consequence of heat recycling. In my model, it's a direct consequence of solar heat flow. Solar power in the standard model is insufficient to create a climate without heat recycling. In the alternative model I've presented, solar power is sufficient to create a climate directly. Global energy budget, empirically, empiricism. The standard model is empirically fictional because you could not observe this from space. This is empirically fictional because you cannot observe this from space. If you were to look at the Earth from space, would you see a flat line with solar energy spread all over that surface like a flat plane with solar energy spread all over that entire surface at once? Is that what you would see? No, that is not what you would see. So it's empirically fictional. You couldn't observe this, so it's empirically unobservable. I could have put in unobservable here, but I put fictional just to make the point. So empirically, the alternative model I've presented, observable. If you were to go out in space and look at the Earth, this is what you would observe. You would observe sunlight falling on a hemisphere of Earth at any given time, and hence that is the average of the way sunlight falls on the Earth. And then you would have a dark side, and you would see that high-intensity sunshine is evaporating water and creating the climate and all, this, all that sort of stuff. So my model is much more empirically observable and realistic than the existing one, which is utterly fictional and empirically unobservable. So thermodynamically, the standard model is inconsistent with theory because it recycles and reverses heat flow. The alternative model I've presented is consistent with theory because I make sure not to reverse heat. I make sure to say that if we start here, we shouldn't have to do reverse heat flow and we should never do reverse heat flow because that's thermodynamically impossible. So as one can see from table one, the standard model and, and, and the alternative model in this paper, although they both conserve total energy to the outside of the system, are entirely mutually exclusive within the bounds of the system itself. The input and output of equal total energies occur over different surface areas, and this difference has an effect on the heating potential of sunlight depicted in such models. That is, is the climate a result of recycling heat energy within itself, or is the climate the result of solar heat flow? In the alternative model presented in Figure 4 with sunlight falling upon the Earth in a realistic fashion, one would immediately identify that the climate is the result of solar heat flow through the atmosphere. That is, without going into the details of the internal minutia, one can at least identify the high temperature heating potential of sunlight and con conclude that the climate is, is the result of solar heat transfer through the atmosphere with heat flowing down the temperature gradient, all available temperature gradients. On the other hand, with a traditional energy budget, one cannot curs cursorily examine it and be led to the idea that solar input power is responsible for creating the climate. Rather, it becomes apparent that the climate is largely the result of the climate creating itself via a fashion of heat recycling of a feeble solar input amplified into a more intense flux of back radiation. Thus, we have mutually exclusive statements about the nature of reality from two models which seemingly should both satisfactorily represent reality. The standard model is presumably a good representation of reality given that it is peer-reviewed and is widely cited in climate research, while the alternative model presented in this paper presumably makes for a good representation of reality because it represents the earth and energy flow into it as it actually empirically exists and is consistent with basic thermodynamic theory. However, both models cannot both be correct given that they indicate mutually exclusive processes. Conclusion. An alternative mean global energy budget was presented which depicts the energy flow into the earth system from the sun in an empirically realistic way. This led to differences from the standard mean global energy budget which are mutually exclusive in nature, and which differences by their nature indicate that either one model or the other must be inconsistent with physics and empirical reality, of course. The reader is left to consider whether or not it is relevant or useful or at all scientific to consider such differences. Okay, so are these important differences? Is non-empiricism versus, versus empiricism 
relevant in physics is consistency with theory versus inconsistency with theory relevant in physics or not okay so i submitted this to the bulletin of the american meteorological society and now i have the peer review return so let's go over the email that i got which gives me the response from the reviewers and the editorial decision you guys are going to love what comes up here peer review so here's peer review functioning so this is a uh, reviewer number two i'll go over peer re uh, reviewer number two because uh um it's not the real juicy part it's good though okay so P reviewer number two this is what he says this is what i was told that reviewer number two said so reviewer number two says this is a thought-provoking manuscript. As a climatologist, I have long used representations of the standard model, such as figures 1, 2, and 3, to help explain the different components of the energy budget to undergraduate students. My aim, along with that of my own teachers, was to get students to understand concepts of the time-averaged long-term annual and space-averaged global fluxes of radiation and sensible latent heat using a schematic and admittedly not wholly realistic representation. However, I think the author makes a good argument, supported by physical reasoning, that a more realistic alternative representation involves the instantaneous Earth disk solar flux powering the climate system rather than the usual implied back radiation greenhouse effects. So this author from the atmosphere. So this author gets what I'm saying, or this reviewer gets what I'm saying. He's saying, oh, th this, this paper is pointing out that there's a pretty big difference here between this solar averaged uh, input where you average the solar power of the entire surface of the earth at once versus real-time solar power which actually uh, powers the climate system. I have a few specific comments below which I would like the author to address in a suitably revised version. Great. So um, in the abstract, so this is a couple of concerns he has. So abstract, because the manuscript is presenting an alternative model for consideration by the climate science community, I think it is important to add clarification at a couple of key points as follows. So line nine. So this is just in the abstract end of first sentence. He's just saying briefly yet succinctly state why there is this incompatibility, leaving the details for the body of the manuscript. Such a statement is necessary because the second sentence takes the incompatibility as read. Okay, so he's saying just make your abstract a little bit more clear. That's what you expect in, in peer review. He's, he's just suggesting make your abstract a little bit more clear so that, so that, so that it's going to drop people in right away uh, so that they know what you're talking about right away instead of assuming that they know what you're talking about so lines 12 to 13 that's still in my abstract he says it is not made clear from the abstract how an incompatibility in representing the global mean energy budget can be extended to science in general this seems like a leap of faith unless you can briefly justify it here interestingly you do not offer such a sweeping uh, inference in the conclusion section of the manuscript. Okay, so he's not actually getting the point that I made. Um, we just went over the conclusion. And in the conclusion, I asked that question, are these differences relevant in, in, in physics and in science? And in my abstract, I discussed that too, that I'm going to present things which which present differences and they, they present a question. So he's, he's just not quite getting the philosophical point I'm making here. Like I'm making a pretty big philosophical point here. You know, is empiricism relevant to science? And also, is consistency between different fields of science relevant in science? So if climate science is inconsistent with thermodynamic physics, is that relevant and is it important? Should climate science be able to make up its own laws and rules of thermodynamics that are inconsistent with textbook definitions in physics classrooms of thermodynamics or not? Is it important? I mean, obviously it is important. So I'm making the, the point that this is something that we need to consider because right now, as I showed in my table and whatnot, there is an existing incompatibility. So he, he just quite didn't get the philosophical point I'm making. So anyway, I could easily respond to that and, and explain that to him. Be no problem, right? And make it more clear in, in, the, in my abstract and in my conclusion. No problem. This is exactly what you would expect in, in, in normal peer review. This is how normal peer review would normally work. Um, so discussion lines 59 to 61. So the uh, reviewer says, so you seem to be saying that it is the instantaneous rather than long-term averaged receipt of the solar flux that is the key starting difference between the standard and alternative models, correct? Yeah, he's getting my point. Yeah, exactly. That That is what I'm saying. So I would just reply to him and say, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I can make that a little bit more clear in the discussion if you like. Sure, no problem. A few extra sentences. Line 64. 
um, discuss only some pertinent gross differences instead. So he just says, just add this in here from the standard representation. He's just suggesting me to make so suggesting for me to make that sentence a little bit more clear. No problem. This is how you expect peer review and someone editing your paper to go. Lines 81 to 82, 82, presumably without the atmospheric green effect back radiation included. So yeah, that was where I was saying that um, the feeble solar input of minus 40 degrees Celsius can't create the climate. And he's saying, you mean without the atmospheric greenhouse effect included? Well, yeah, exactly. I'm saying that without the greenhouse effect in your existing models, you can't create a climate because you've made sunshine so cold that it can't create the climate. So he's just seeking clarification on that. Perfect. And then lines 158 and 178, he's just suggesting a uh, spelling correction. I, I spelled the lead with LED, or I spelled it with LEAD, but it's supposed to be LED. Perfect. Great. That's how you expect peer review to go. That would be normal. I could answer those things and then go on for publication. Great. That's what you expect. Now, let's look at the other reviewer, reviewer number one. This is where we're going to find some really amazing comments. Reviewer number one. Of course, the answer to the proposed question is that the energy cycle must be physically consistent and explain observations. The proposed cycle is incomplete and quite wrong in so many ways. So this is reviewer number one responding to the question I asked in my abstract, and then he's responding right away to what he thinks of my diagram. So what I had said, he's referring to the question I asked, and the question I asked in the abstract was, a question then arises out of this incompatibility as to whether or not global energy budget models should be consistent with the laws of thermodynamics and physics and empirical reality, or if there is no requirement of such within science in general. So he says, of course, the answer to the posed question is yes, that the energy cycle must be physically consistent and explain observations. But then he says, your proposed cycle is incomplete and quite wrong in so many ways. So he's saying that this is quite wrong. What I've attempted to, de to depict here with sunlight falling only over a hemisphere with a night side of the earth, with sunshine being very strong right underneath the sun, so that's around the equator, and falling off in intensity with solar power strong enough to heat things to high temperature with enough energy, enough energy flux coming in to generate meteorological responses such as um, clouds and evaporation and whatnot and heating that we feel on the surface. So he's saying that my cycle is incomplete and quite wrong in so many ways. But this, he's saying, therefore, must be fine where solar input comes in at minus 40 can't create the climate and therefore you need to use heat recycling to create the climate instead so that's his opinion okay great let's go on he's not quite getting the point is he like he's obviously immediately he's missed the point entirely he has <laughs> okay let's go on <clears throat> so he says line 32 in my paper. This is not quite correct. I'll, I'll show you what it is in a second. He says, this is not quite correct. The figure depicts the global and annual average, and as such, it fully accounts for all of the geometry and rotation of the planet, as well as the seasonal cycle. So what had I said? I had said on line 32, one main point of consistency between these three figures is that solar power is averaged over the surface of the Earth. That is, the cross-section intercept of solar power by Earth's disk is averaged over the sphere of the Earth, giving the division by four as the ratio of a disk area to that of a sphere's area with the same radius, such as to average the disk intercept over the entire sphere. This is noted as, noted as the one-fourth divisor in figures two and three, which numerically is the 342 as in figure one. So he says, this is not quite correct. The figure depicts the global and annual average, and as such, it fully accounts for all of the geometry and rotation of the planet, as well as the seasonal cycle. That is precisely what I say here. That is precisely what I'm discussing. That's precisely what I'm explaining in terms of the mathematical process which is done. You take the intercept of sun, sunshine that the Earth is intercepting and you spread it over the entire surface area of the Earth. Yes, that is precisely what I'm saying. Because you're taking that sun, that input, and you're spreading it over the entire sphere of the earth. So of course the sphere is rotating and you, that includes seasonal cycle, that includes everything because you're spreading it over the entire earth. So if you take the solar input and you're spreading it over the entire earth, of course then 
you are averaging out all of the geometry and rotation and seasonal cycle. So it's, whatever he's saying here, he's not understanding at all what I just said. I just said exactly what he says. So it's not clear what he's actually saying. He's saying this is not quite correct. I, I just explained the mathematical process of what he is talking about here. I just explained the mathematical process of what he's describing right here. So he has clearly missed the point once again. <clears throat> so going on, line 37 and 43. Figures 2 and 3 are redundant with each other and work fine. Okay, good. Yeah. It is easy to show that without the one layer atmosphere, the surface temperature is a lot colder than with. The greenhouse effect works. A key point is that the sun adds heat and is external to the system. Okay. So let's get to the real crux of it. It's this sentence. He says, or she, whoever it is, it is easy to show that without the one layer atmosphere, the surface temperature is a lot colder than with. Yes, I know. This is what I'm referring to. In your models, you average sunshine over the entire surface of the Earth, and doing that reduces sunshine by a factor of four and makes sunshine only minus 40 degrees Celsius, as in this diagram. So it's easy to show, he says, it's easy to show that without the one layer atmosphere, the surface temperature is a lot colder than with. Yes, I know. That's what I'm referring to. I'm referring to how when you spread sunshine over the, yeah, I mean, yes, that's your model. That's your model. In your model, you make sunshine extremely cold and get an extremely cold surface of only minus 18 degrees Celsius input. And then you add on heat recycling and back radiation from this atmosphere you add on to make up the difference that the sun cannot do. This is exactly what I'm referring to. So he's, his comments don't really address what I'm actually referring to. He keeps missing the point. Line 60, he says, as such, it does not depict a mean state. If it depicts an equilibrium state, then the temperature on the night side goes to absolute zero. It is absurd to ignore the connectivity of the atmosphere and also thermal capacity of the oceans and land. Okay, so what had I actually said here? I had said in line 60, an alternative global annual energy budget model is here presented in figure four, which differs in that it does not average sunshine over the whole surface of the earth as an input. So he says, as such as it does not depict a mean state. Well, how is that not the average? If at any one time, sunshine is only over a hemisphere, at any one time you ever look, sunshine is only ever falling on a hemisphere, then how is that not the mean state of how sunshine inputs to the earth? If at any given time, sunshine is only falling on a hemisphere, then that means that the average mean way that sunshine comes into the earth is over a hemisphere. So what does he mean? It does not depict a mean state. Of course, this is the mean state. Here's the mean energy coming in. Here's how it falls on average over the hemisphere, over a hemisphere that it falls on with the earth rotating beneath it. That's how sunlight comes in on average, since that's how it comes in at any given time. So the average of something which occurs at any given time is the same thing as the thing at any given time, right? And then you have the night side. But he says that the night side must go to absolute zero. So he's thinking that I'm presenting this as some sort of static model where the night side is in complete darkness permanently. No, obviously it's rotating underneath that. He doesn't seem to get basic things. Then he says it is absurd to ignore the connectivity of the atmosphere and also the thermal capacity of the oceans and land. I haven't ignored those things. I haven't even represented them. I assume we have a mutual understanding that it's all connected. I assume we would acknowledge that together. I mean, how many assumptions do I need to write in the paper? I mean, obviously I need to put in a lot of assumptions because these people think, you know, I have to explain to them that there's a difference between flat earth and, and spherical earth, for example. So I can't even assume that these people understand that the earth is spherical. I have to explain to them that the earth is spherical and that it makes a difference. Then he goes on line 72 now has the earth rotating, but still no atmosphere. So what I had said in line 72 was certainly the surface of the earth is rotating beneath the hemispherical input, but at any time the input was only over hemisphere and has the expected geometrical intensity distribution. 
Well, of course the Earth is rotating. Who would who would who would create a model with the Earth not rotating? You guys. Your flat Earth models have the Earth not rotating because that's the only way you can create that average model. Your model is the one with the Earth not rotating. Of course. I mean, I guess I'll have to put that if I edit this paper. I'll have to put in. I mean, I did put in. Of course, it's rotating. But he's, he's still like, you're saying that the Earth is rotating now? Like, this has really confused him. But And then he says, but still no atmosphere. I, of course, I, of course, we assume that there's an atmosphere. But we're talking about the Earth. Can I not assume that you would understand that I understand that there's an atmosphere? Bonkers. Okay. Line 78 to 95. The reviewer says, this is quite wrong. Where does the author think, author think that the energy goes? As depicted in figure one, most goes through to the surface and heats the ground and oceans. So what, I had, what had I said on line 78 to 95? I said, in the standard global energy budget, with solar power being diluted over a total surface area, it never actually spreads upon the entire spherical surface at once. Solar power is thus reduced to 168 watts per meter squared, which is an equivalent temperature forcing on a black body of minus 40 C or minus 40 Fahrenheit. In other words, whole surface average solar power is extremely feeble, and we wouldn't expect a climate, let alone even a gaseous atmosphere at such a low heating potential supplied by the sun. On the other hand, this alternative global energy budget supplies solar power only over a hemisphere, which sunlight ever falls upon giving an average forcing of 480 watts per meter squared, a temperature forcing of 30 C or 86 Fahrenheit, but which maximizes around the zenith at 960 watts per meter squared. Of course, the sun is most intense under the zenith, directly under the sun, at 87 Celsius or 188 Fahrenheit. And so solar power is capable of performing and producing very different physical responses between these two energy budgets, particularly, particularly in the examples of, say, being able to melt ice or the ability the ability to generate cumulonimbus clouds. So he's saying to this whole paragraph that this is quite wrong. Where does the author think of the energy goes? As depicted in figure one, most goes through to the surface and heats the ground in oceans. I am pointing out that in your figure one, solar input is 168 watts per meter squared, which is only minus 40 degrees Celsius worth of temperature forcing. So what am I saying that's wrong here? I am describing what is in the existing model, and I'm describing how it is different to my model. What is he saying that's wrong? Where does the author think that the energy goes? As depicted in figure one, most goes through the surface and heats the ground. Of course, that's what I'm talking about. I am talking about solar power going in and heating the ground in oceans. That's what I'm talking about, and I'm talking about the difference in temperature at which it does that. So what is this reviewer even talking about? This comment makes no sense. You can't even interpret what he is actually thinking. He says, this is quite wrong. And then he says, where does the author think the energy goes? Well, I just explained that. And he says, as depicted in figure one, the standard budget, most goes through the surface and, and, and most goes through to the surface and heats the ground. Yes. So he says, this is quite wrong. And then he says, what I actually did is the, what I actually wrote is how you should think of it. These people can't even form coherent thoughts. How can you get someone to review your paper who cannot even form coherent thoughts and says that what I said is quite wrong even though what I said was exactly what he is describing in his second sentence. Okay, <clears throat> line 99 to 110. One needs to be very careful about quoting things like this out of context. In particular, the Earth is not a closed system. And perhaps another principle that should be stated is that all bodies radiate related to their absolute temperature. Hence, even very cold bodies radiate heat energy towards warmer ones. Now, that is an absolute lie. Cold bodies do not radiate heat energy to warmer ones. Any body can radiate energy. All bodies with a temperature above absolute zero will radiate a temp a, an ice cube. When you pull an ice cube out of your freezer, it is actually radiating some thermal energy. But does that energy behave and act as heat? Does it have the capacity 
and the potential and the power and strength to act as heat to you? Do you take that ice cube out of the freezer and feel that it's heating you up? Or can it heat you up? No, it does not transfer heat. So this is different than conduction of heat, which is down gradient. So he's saying that that um, radiation can heat from cold to hot, but that's different from conduction, which is down gradient only. The author needs to frame all this in terms of energy, not heat. Now, this person is just totally incompetent in thermodynamics. He has no clue what he's talking about. One of the most important concepts in thermodynamics is that energy and heat are not the same thing. Heat is a transient form of energy which can only exist when energy is flowing between objects of different temperature and in this case and in that case you get heat which flows from the hot body to the cold body the hot body warms up the cooler body the cooler body does not warm up the warmer body so he's referring to my quote here about the property of heat flow about how it's irreversible now this quote in thermal physics <clears throat> all these quotes which you can find in any textbook, are talking about heat as a, as a concept, as a property, as a, as a mathematical principle, as a physical principle in, in physics. They talk about heat. And the thing about heat is that all modes of heat transfer obey the same rules, and that is from hot to cold. That is why in thermodynamics textbooks, there's never a caveat. In this textbook, if you go to it, and if you go to any other textbook and it describes how heat flows from hot to cold and that it's irreversible, there is no caveat which says, except for radiation. There's no caveat that says, this is how heat works with conduction and with matter, but it works differently for radiation. And here's our different definition of how heat works with radiation. That does not exist in thermodynamics textbooks and in thermodynamic theory. Heat is a distinct principle unto itself and it has several different modes of heat transfer, conduction, diffusion, and radiation. And all those modes of heat transfer follow the same rule. That's why they are called modes of heat transfer. Heat transfer is the thing, and it has several different ways that it does it. And all those cases, and all those different ways that it does it, it does it the same way, from hot to cold. So this person is lying. He is outright lying. He has no... Why doesn't he provide me a textbook reference then? I've provided a textbook reference in my paper, and I stated in my paper that you can go find many more references in textbooks to just this idea. He's saying, no, that's not true. It doesn't apply to radiation. You should give me a textbook reference then, shouldn't you, as the reviewer? The thing is, they cannot give a textbook reference to what he's trying to say here because it doesn't exist. Because it's false, what he's attempting to do here. He's trying to put this in terms of energy, not heat. Well, the distinction between heat and energy is paramount in thermodynamics. It's the most important thing of all. Heat is what you need in the first law of thermodynamics. Heat is what you need. It states that heat is what you need to increase temperature, heat or work. If you want to get an increase in temperature in a body of matter, then that body requires either heat and or work supplied to it. Okay? Not just energy, but heat. So then you have to go to, well, what is heat then? If the first law of thermodynamics says that you need heat to increase temperature, what is heat? And then it, you go and you find out what heat is. Heat is a form of energy which flows only from hot to cold because the hot body has higher frequency energy states, higher agitation in its molecules, higher agitation in its electromagnetic waves that it outputs. It has higher agitation that the cooler body doesn't have. So the cooler body coming into contact, either radiative contact or physical contact with a hot, hotter body, then becomes more highly agitated. It picks up the higher frequencies of agitation, thermal agitation, higher temperature from the hotter body. It picks it up. It's, you know, initially the cold object is just vibrating a little bit, slowly, comes in contact either with radiation by radiation or physical contact with a hotter body, and then it starts agitating more and faster, and that's what its raised temperature is. Now that happens by radiation, with higher frequency radiation causes that increased agitation in the cooler body, or by the molecules bouncing against each other, uh, quote unquote, physically, with a virtual photon exchange, when those bodies are in physical contact, right? This is important, this is basic thermodynamics, and this reviewer has no clue of the 
of the distinctions here. Hence, even very cold bodies radiate heat energy toward warmer ones. This is a lie. It is a lie, and he should have presented me then. Like, how come I ha am expected to provide textbook references? But when I provide textbook references, then they say, no, not true. And the, but then they don't provide their own textbook reference to fill me in. He cannot provide any textbook reference to support this. There are none. But that's how peer review goes. You have some incompetent idiot peer reviewing you that has no clue what he's talking about. How, how is this a useful process? The author needs to frame this in terms of energy and not heat. The most important thing is the distinction between energy and heat. You need heat to... Why, why would you do that? What does he even mean? Only talk about energy, not heat. But you have to talk about when energy can act as heat. I mean, he's saying to reject thermodynamic theory. That's what this comment is. The author needs to frame this in terms of energy, not heat. That is a request to not use thermodynamic theory. He's saying the author should not use thermodynamic theory and should not use references to textbooks on thermodynamics. And we're going to say these other things about thermodynamics, that cold bodies radiate heat to warmer bodies, even though we can't come up with our own textbook references to support this claim. So, next one, line 117. The, review, the, the reviewer says, this is wrong. It uses only one piece of the flow of energy. The back radiation is less. So what did I say, line 117? I said the point being here that the standard global energy model predicts or depicts 324 watts per meter squared of back radiation flowing to the Earth's surface from the atmosphere, a quantity nearly two times larger than the solar input of 168. This implies that the atmosphere heats, heats the surface with a far greater power than the sun does. Now, that's right here. Look, that solar power absorbed by its surface is the 168. Here's greenhouse gases and back radiation. That's 324. It's right there in the figure. And what does he say? He says this is wrong. The back radiation is less. He is completely lying and contradicting the very own figure, which is the basis of his climate science. This is wrong. The back radiation is less. I referred directly to the figure. 168. Solar input absorbed by surface. 168. Back radiation absorbed by surface. 324. It's right in your figure. All I did in this paragraph was state what is in the figure. And he says, this is wrong. The back radiation is less. Is 324 less than 168? Do you see that these people are just lying? This is peer review, and they lie. They just lie. Is 324 less than 168? <clears throat> Next one, line 121, reviewer number one. How does the author think the atmosphere gets heated? For the most part, it is transparent to incoming radiation, and most heat is from latent heating, condensation of water, plus sensible heat from eddies. Almost none from conduction. Okay, and what had I said in line 121? However, since the origin of energy, and specifically heat, is the sunlight and its initial absorption into terrestrial matter, that it is implied that energy, originally from the sun, has a second and a third go around at heating the surface. So he says, how does the author think that the atmosphere gets heated? Well, I've stated, I said, I think that the atmosphere gets heated because the sun heats the earth and then heat flows down temperature gradients, which includes into the atmosphere. I mean, obviously, he says, most heat is from latent heating and sensible heat from, eddy, from eddies. Okay, that is the point in my paper. How do you get latent heat in water, in liquid water and, and in vaporous water? How do you get that latent heat? Can minus 40 degrees Celsius input transform ice into water so that ice transforms through, as ice is melting and going into water, you have a latent heat phase where even though the water, the ice is gathering energy, 
it doesn't increase in temperature. It stays at zero degrees Celsius for a little while because it's just absorbing energy, absorbing energy, absorbing energy into latent heat. And then once it breaks through that latent heat phase, then it starts increasing in temperature again. You need hot enough input to do that. You need input, which is at least zero degrees Celsius, but you know, obviously higher because you want to get to higher temperature than zero degrees Celsius than freezing. You need a strong enough input to do that. So does minus 40 degrees Celsius input from sunlight do that? Does that supply enough flux and intensity and agitated radiation to agitate matter in, in such a way to produce that latent heat phase? No, minus 40 degrees Celsius sunlight cannot do that. So how does the author think the atmosphere gets heated? Well, that's what I've stated in my paper. I think it gets heated from solar heat flow. And you need an, an intense enough heat flow to generate from the sun in order to generate the meteorological responses as a consequence. So what is he even saying here? He's not really saying anything relevant. Okay, now, oh, go back, back, back. Okay, now, here we go. This is going to be a good one. Really, really fun one. Reviewer number one, line 20. Line 129, he says, but it can't actually, as described above. So what is he saying? What's my line 129? Let's look at my one line 129, you guys. Line 129, JP, me. That is, incoming sunshine of high intensity flux is capable of directly producing climatological effects. By that, I mean meteorology, the weather, clouds, as a response to heat flow from the sun. So what I said was, incoming sunshine of high intensity flux is capable of directly producing our climate as a response to heat flow from the sun. And his objection to my statement is, it can't. There you have it, folks. Scientific peer review in modern science, modern climatology, modern physics, the sun does not create the climate. That's the basis of climate science. That's the basis of climate science, and that's why this peer reviewer has disagreed with my paper, because in my paper, I tried to say that the sun creates the climate. And he says it can't. He says, as described above, what he's describing, what he's referring to is his previous comment, which was this one. And this comment doesn't make any sense in his previous comment here, too. And they, you know, just go back and see what we said about those. So he's just saying, he didn't describe anything above that contradicts what I've said. There you go. That's the basic climate science. And this is in modern physics, guys. I, I talk to PhDs in physics at my university who agree with this reviewer. They would agree with this reviewer. They would say, well, it's peer-reviewed. It, it's peer-reviewed that the sun doesn't create the climate. So that, that's how it goes. So that's, that's, that's the truth. You shouldn't try to budge in on their field because you're not an expert in climate science. They are. They're the experts in climate science. So you, you, you're not even a climate scientist. You're an astrophysicist. So why would, you, why would you try to write a paper in a climate science journal if you're only an astrophysicist and not a climate scientist? And I'm like, well, well, the climate scientists are ignoring thermodynamics and, uh, and they're saying that the sun doesn't create the climate. Bigot. <laughs> there you have it. Can you believe that, guys? Right there. It can't actually. The sun does not create the climate. This is what modern scientists and modern climatologists think, how our climate works. They think that our climate is created by greenhouse gases. And because our emission of greenhouse gases, they think, is going to create more climate. That's what they think. They think that the sun doesn't create the climate. Greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide create the climate. Because the sun is too cold. The sun is freezing cold. Basically, we can leave the sun out, almost. I mean, minus 40 degrees Celsius. Where do you got to go to find minus 40 degrees Celsius? I mean, that's a pretty rare temperature to find on Earth, right? So basically, the sun is almost nowhere creating the climate. It's back radiation and the greenhouse gases which are creating the climate. Now, the thing is, you guys, you're releasing more greenhouse gases. That means you're creating more climate. And creating more climate is bad. And you should be taxed for creating more climate. Can you believe how psychotic this situation is? So one more thing, a couple more things. Line 132, he says, you can fuse heat flow with energy flow. Oh, oh, I do. Do I? We've already saw this fellow's uh, grasp of thermodynamics. What did I actually say on line 132? I said, 
this flow, so this heat flow from the sun, should step down in intensity as heat flows down temperature gradients to the system because that's what heat does. It flows down temperature gradients. That's what, that's what heat does. If you have more agitated or higher frequency energy, it will flow into the lower frequency objects and increase their frequency to make them the same. That, that's, that's what heat flow does. So heat flow from the sun will flow down temperature gradients through the system as manifest climate. I'm saying that as heat flows through our system, heat from the sun flows through the system of Earth, you get physical responses. And those physical responses are what we call our weather. Those physical responses are meteorology. Those physical responses in net are our climate. And without requiring the reversibility of heat flow, because if you read any thermodynamics textbook, they all are quite clear about the irreversibility of heat flow. They all, because it's all about entry and sharing of microstates and things like that. They all say that. So he's saying I confuse heat flow with energy flow? No, I gave you a textbook reference definition to heat flow. And one of the most important things in thermodynamics is that there's a difference between heat and energy. So obviously I have gone way, I've, my error was I assumed that these people would respect a textbook reference to heat flow and a description of heat flow. And that I said that you can go and find this description in any other textbooks, they don't care. And he's saying, I'm confusing it. No. Where's your textbook references? They're confusing it, obviously. It's just so ridiculous. So line 149, he says, this is all nonsense. None of it has been demonstrated. And the principles upon which it is based are wrong. For instance, what about the hemisphere in the dark? So what did I say on line 149? And the alternative model presented in figure four with sunlight falling upon the earth in a realistic fashion, one would immediately identify that the climate is a result of solar heat flow of the atmosphere. He's saying that's all nonsense. And I haven't demonstrated that. And the principles of that are wrong. That is, without going the, into the details of the internal minutia, one can at least identify the high temperature heating potential of sunlight and conclude that the climate is the result of solar heat transfer through the atmosphere with heat flowing down the gradient, temperature gradient. So he's just restating what he did previously, a couple slides ago, that the sun doesn't create the climate. So he's saying this is all nonsense. So um, sunlight falls on a hemisphere, all nonsense, not demonstrated. Climate is a result of solar heat flow through the atmosphere. All nonsense, not demonstrated, bad principles. Oh yeah, and it's wrong principles. So wrong principle that sun only falls in a hemisphere. One can at least identify the high temperature heating potential of sunlight. He says that's all nonsense, not demonstrated, bad principles, wrong principles. Climate is, is the result of solar heat transfer, nonsense. Heat flowing down temperature gradients, wrong, all nonsense, not demonstrated, wrong principles. He's just saying that. So he's saying that, well, I mean, I just went over it. I can't do this much longer because when I got this response yesterday, the other review, I didn't mind. That's how you would expect peer review to go. This one, I read this one a couple of times, flabbergasted at what I was reading. You know what I did? Guys, do you know what I did after reading this? I went and had a shower. I'd already showered that day, yesterday morning. I got this response about 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I read it a couple of times and I had to take a shower because it was so filthy. This reviewer number one is so filthy and slimy. Amazing. So here's the editor's decision. So then at the end of that, editor, decision, reject. Although the reviews are somewhat at odds, the concerns raised by reviewer number one are fundamental and significant and echoed at times by reviewer number two. That's my decision. No, reviewer number one and number two were pretty much opposite. So I wrote back to the editor and I said, the concerns raised by your reviewer number one, however, can be addressed. It seems premature to not have the opportunity to address them. I mean, that's what you do in peer review. The reviewer reviews your things, has some concerns, and then you address them especially in the case where reviewer number two responds positively to the thought-provoking nature of the manuscript. These are typically precisely the instances in which an author should have an opportunity to address the reviewer's concerns. I thus kindly request the opportunity to address the reviewers, and thus a reconsideration of your editorial decision. Now, I just wrote that back. They never reconsider because it's like, you know, it's kind of like asking a general to, you know, go back on his orders, right? It's like, I'm the editor. This is my decision. I'm not reconsidering, right? That's like, does the editor 
So do, do you think that the editor has any idea what reviewer number one actually said? Does the editor appreciate that reviewer number one said that the sun doesn't create the climate? The editor probably has no clue. He's just taking sort of an, an assessment. He's scanning through and taking the best assessment he can without actually having any knowledge of anything. And it's probably emotional at this point. And he's saying, well, the reviewer number one sounds kind of difficult or sounds kind of nasty. Well, I'll just reject this then. It's like, why not give me the opportunity to address? Note how my table, remember that table I had in my paper, that excellent table where I talk about the differences and to make it so clear about what the differences are and why that would be important. Maybe it's self-evident that these differences are important. They completely ignored my table. This reviewer didn't even discuss it or reference it. So what we face, you have now all witnessed the peer review process. What do you think of it? Oh, wow. Sure is intelligent, isn't it? Sure is a trustworthy mechanism for truth, isn't it? You have now all witnessed a modern scientist, a modern climatologist, reject the proposal that the sun heats the earth. Now think about that. Who would ever say that the sun doesn't heat the earth? Who would say that? What human in their right mind would ever say that? But this person freely says it in peer review. And because he says it in peer review, he gets to reject my paper that says that the sun heats the earth. What human would ever say that the sun doesn't heat the earth? What sort of insanity is that? So we're not facing humans with right minds. Interpret that as you may. Now, well, I was going to reflect on something. I don't feel like it because it's been going on too long. Um, well, anyway, I had hopes just for personal satisfaction that it would be published because I thought, well, that's good. Then, you know, maybe that'll make a difference. People will notice. But the truth is that this is an endemic problem in science. It's an endemic problem with the method itself. That paper had to be rejected. You know, I was expecting it to be rejected, and then I was expecting that I would produce this video exactly as I have. I, I expected exactly how this would go. It would have been nice if it was published, because then I, I, at the same time, would have said, hey, look what was published. They're finally acknowledging that there's a problem with their climate alarmism and their idea that humans need to be taxed for creating the climate because the sun doesn't. Humans create the climate with carbon dioxide emissions. The sun doesn't create the climate. <laughs> so anyway, this problem is obviously endemic to science itself, given that this is widespread. This whole fraud is widespread throughout the entire scientific community. It's not just the field of climate science is a fraud, although climate science is the vector by which this fraud has infected the whole rest of the whole academic uh, university paradigm. The entire thing has become fraudulent. How can you trust this method? This method had to be exposed. This paper had to be rejected so that I could produce this video and show you what actually happens and show you what value peer review actually has for getting truth into the public. How many papers have been rejected in history because somebody discovered something new, a new way of looking at something that, was trans that would have been transformational, that would have been beneficial, that would have given us a deeper understanding of reality, but because you have entrenched idiots whose paycheck depends on people not understanding reality that then reject papers. This reviewer number two, his paycheck depends on people not understanding that the sun creates the climate. Therefore, he rejects papers where people say that the sun creates the climate. Imagine how many other times this has happened with other things and other subjects in science. How is this peer review process an avenue for generating truth and inserting truth into the scientific uh, scientific and uh, global human psyche. Obviously it isn't, guys. Obviously we have a major problem here. Major problem, we need a revolution. And we have. You know one thing that would help? I should be able to sue that person for lying. For lying and rejecting my and getting my paper rejected by lying. He lied through his teeth. Lied. I should be able to sue. The only way that you can fix stuff is to make people hurt for it. If these people could be financially hurt and damaged, you're damn right that all of a sudden truth would be much more important to them than their lives because right now it financially benefits them to lie. Right now, when they get to lie about the sun not creating the climate, when they get to lie about that and make that lie, it benefits them financially because that's what they're getting paid to do. If we could sue these people out of existence very quickly, because they're being hurt and damaged for their lives, very quickly you would see them stop doing it. Very quickly. 
the peer review system in producing what it already has is this something which can, must, only be destroyed. It's all a racket. It's all 100% hijackable. It's not trustworthy, not repairable. We need a new system. We need Kurt Doodlittle's proprietarianism. And we also need, in the scientific philosophical aspect, in the philosophy of science, ontological mathematics, where we base mathematics on rational principles rather than fictional principles and then present that these fictional ideas represent reality, such as this fictional idea in climate alarm of a flat earth with sunshine spread over the entire surface area of the earth at once. They've done that in math, and then they've said, because they've done that in math, that's what we're going to base our entire science upon. To fix that philosophically, we need ontological mathematics, where we recognize that math, our math we use in physics, must correspond to rational principles, rational ideas, reason, and empiricism. You cannot violate reality with mathematics that way and get away with it. They are doing it right now, and the way they're getting away with it is they're creating this parasitical, parasitical racket to tax us and fine us for creating the climate. And creating more climate is bad because the sun doesn't create the climate, but we create the climate, and therefore we should be taxed for it. It's all a parasitical racket, and they need to be sued out of existence. So we need proprietarianism so that we can sue these people out of existence. These people should not be allowed scientific thinking. They should not be allowed academia or education anywhere close ever again. They shouldn't be allowed anywhere close to it ever again. That's what proprietarianism will give us. When we can start finding and suing these people out of existence, the last place these people will go back to is science and our education system and academia. Won't that be wonderful? Could you imagine suing these people out of, it, out of their financial existence and making it so that the last place they feel safe is going anywhere near our education system? I know so many PhDs at my university and these people who could be sued out of existence this way and they would never go near education and academia ever again because a person like me could sue them out of existence for their obvious, blatant, lies that any jury would support me in, that any jury would find me successful. If I take a jury of laymen and I say to them, does the sun create the climate? They are all, anyone is going to, anyone knows that the sun is more than minus 40 degrees Celsius. Anyone knows that sunshine is hot and you need high intensity sunshine to create water vapor, to create latent heat, to create clouds, to create meteorology, meteorological effects, to create the weather. Anyone knows that. But these people in peer review just get to lie through their damned teeth to protect their racket. So, proprietarianism, to sue these people out of existence, who's that going to leave in academia? If you sue all these frauds out of existence so that they're nowhere near academia and education again, who's that going to leave in academia and education? My God, my goodness. It's going to leave really great, honest, hardworking people who are discovering real things and who can back up what they say with real actual science can you imagine what that will do that is warp drive right now we have an academia infested with these parasites who are creating this bullshit so that they can protect their paycheck just imagine the friction just imagine the waste and the entropy being created right now just imagine how new ideas and new thoughts and new science is prevented from being presented to the public by these people. So who would be left? Who would be left as the people we actually want? It would be warp drive for our science. It, it, it would propel us into the future so fast if, you, if we restricted academia to the only people, to the people who should actually be there, which are, for the most part, not the people who are there today. Pretty much nine, pretty much 98%, I estimate, 95% of the people who are there today should not be there. So that's why we need proprietarianism. Then we need the new uh, philosophy of science. And the philosophy of science is going to be ontological mathematics, where we appreciate the philosophy and the use of mathematics for describing rational principles, real things, 
at the very least, things which can be empirically demonstrated and consistent with a rational interpretation of empirical reality. That's that. Okay, great. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. And yeah, it was frozen for a minute. Okay, hope you guys enjoyed that. That was fine. I think that was a really long video, hour 12 minutes. Hope you guys got through it. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye.